Next question. Which animals can feel love? How would you characterize the difference in bonding and feelings that cats and dogs have with each other or with humans? To me, cats seem to have less emotion. Mm. Um, so let's say a couple things that I think are pretty clear. One, that the love thing starts with, um, with maternal love of offspring, that this will be separately evolved in birds and mammals and possibly other things. You know, you have the potential for it in something like a crocodile. But any place where parents take care of offspring, you could... I'm not saying they do. I'm saying they could. I've just never... I Never, never considered it before. Well, the one time I raised a crocodile, I wondered if it would develop an affection for me, and may it did I? not. May I? You may, I may guess. I? All right. Well, this is awkward, this and it's is. about to get even more awkward. Yeah. Um, but anyway, all I'm saying is that you've got the potential for love any place where um, a parent must be devoted enough to offspring uh, to raise them to adulthood and crocodiles are possible, but I've never seen any evidence of that emotion, but in birds you'll see it. Oh my God. All right. Well, you want to explain it before I put it up? Yeah. Just put it up first. Uh, yeah. Why don't you put it up? Oh man, it's big. Okay. So, all right. So there's this. This is weird. Yeah. Okay. Here we have Brett at the age of, I don't know, uh, 20, four. Yeah. That's a, that's a picture of me when I was younger, but, but um, they all are. And he has, his firstborn in his mouth. <laughs> First hatched. <laughs> Only hatched, as a matter of fact. Okay, I'll just, we'll take it down. For the, I'll put it back here for the moment, okay? You can explain? Um, <laughs> no, not really. Oh, no, okay. Well, look, obviously, anybody who knows anything about uh, crocodile ecology and behavior knows that in order for a crocodile to get a proper start in life... Um, you got reflection. You need to tilt it if you want people okay. to see it. Um, in order for a crocodile to get a proper start in life, yeah, it's somewhat better. The crocodile must make it from the nest to the water. And the way its mother will accomplish that is to transport them uh, in its mouth. And so here's the story. Oh, God, how did we end up here? Um, I was living. You said mammals have love. It's maternal love. Birds have a separate evolution and maybe crocodiles. Yeah. We have this picture in the next room. If you're going to bring up crocodiles and love in the same sentence. I did it to myself is what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> totally did it to Here's yourself. the story I would of not that. do this on the main live stream. I right. would not do this to, to anyone who showed up at YouTube. Why not? But, yeah. okay. Uh, I was working on Barrow, Colorado Island in the Panama Canal. Barrow, Colorado Island was a hilltop in the canal zone. And when the canal was filled in 1913-14, it was isolated. It became an island. And I think it was Frank Barber was a biologist who realized that this was a fantastic opportunity to study the ecology of a tropical habitat because this habitat was about to become completely isolated. We were going to know exactly when it happened. And so he convinced the Smithsonian, which of course this was the canal zone. So the Americans had um, governance rights over it. <clears throat> yep. Um, he convinced the Smithsonian to take over this island, and they built a research station, which exists there to this day. It's the most studied piece of tropical habitat on Earth, and it's a marvelous place. And it has infrastructure that allows you to live there well. So anyway, I lived there. Actually, if you look at a book called The Tapir's Morning Bath um, by hey, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Reut, you will find a dis one chapter is dedicated to me and my bat work back when I was just a pup. She calls you, you're back in your grad school days, the Maverick Scientist. Maverick Scientist. Brett Weinstein. Yeah, she was, she was playing off Brett Maverick, which probably you all are too young to even know what Brett Maverick is. But I actually didn't know that. No. I don't know what a Brett Maverick is either. It was a I'm show apparently not too young. The, it was a, I think it was a... Wild West thing. But anyway, um, so I was living there and the people who live there are all, you know, goofy field rats. They're all obsessed with some organism or other and they're all cool people. It's a really exciting place to live. Some of them were actually obsessed with field rats when we were there. Yeah, spiny rats. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so we all traded natural history stories. Oh, there's this thing out at the end of, you know, Barber Trail you can go see. And, you know, anyway, so that was just part of the culture. Got of the a place. fair to lance, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Actually, none on, there are not fair to lances on 
uh, BCI proper. Not that's right. Right. In no, theory, in fact, no vipers, no poisonous snakes at all. And, wow. and even though the little islands in the canal God, do have them, that. and the thought is that BCI is big enough to have peccaries, which stamp out the poisonous snakes. And so, anyway, there are no. The way you said that, it sounded like we're still looking for the peccaries. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, it's known that they have peccaries. Yeah, but it's the idea is that the peccaries are actually the reason. The reason that there are no poisonous snakes on this island and, that and, is otherwise much more diverse than the little islands, and perhaps that they actually intentionally um, kill the snakes that yep. they are you know pigs are smart and that they find poisonous snakes and they kill them yep okay so uh, it became known uh, at the point that a crocodile buried a nest full of eggs on the island where the nest was and so we were all paying attention to this nest which didn't look like anything it just looked like a piece of beach um, at this one spot and then one night the thing happens that happens, which is the little uh, crocodiles are ready to hatch. And so they start beeping. There's this beeping noise that they make, and it's adorable. But anyway, you know, the beach starts beeping in this place, and everybody's like, hey, the crocodiles are Sounds hatching. like the beach is backing up. <laughs> it does. A, a lot like that, as a matter of fact. Anyway, so I was, uh, you know, very into photography, and this was going to be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and set up my camera and got ready, and they started hatching, and the mother was carrying them to the... Uh, water and she stopped at some and that's point. that's how that's what a mama crocodile looks like she, well, she carries them in her mouth in her mouth to the water and then they group somewhere and the mother hangs out with the babies and so you can see in certain places if a mother has a nest full of babies that have hatched you know under some overhanging plant somewhere if you go out there at night you'll see a large pair of crocodile eyes and a bunch of little eyes right <laughs> um it's very cool so cute but anyway she stopped picking the babies up from the nest and we thought that our photographing her- You were there with some other people. Yeah, uh -huh. we thought that we had driven her off and that the babies were gonna die. And so I took one of these eggs, which was not opening, and I decided- But it, but it was beeping. Yeah, I, it, it was hard to tell what was beeping. I thought this egg was ready to hatch. Yeah. It did not hatch, and I thought that we had driven the mother off and therefore we're going to have killed these crocodiles. Mm-hmm. So I opened this egg to free it, and I was going to take it to the water and wish it good luck. Mm -hmm. And when I opened the egg, it was not done developing, which meant its belly was open, and there was a big yolk sac sitting there. And I decided, oh, shit, now what have I done? And I took the animal, and I made a, uh, a tub that I put in the bathtub in my decrepit. I was living, I was the last resident of Kodak, uh, Kodak um, Dormitory, College, which yeah. was one of the original you know, 1913 structures on the island. Anyway. You were there because you preferred it uh, in part because it was more private, but it also had no AC. And so you didn't, every time I you hated. walked in, you didn't, you did you never, you didn't get the climate control. So you slept hotter, yeah. but you also didn't constantly lose your acclimation to the tropical environment, which you were doing your work. Well, and then there was the best part about it, which was, so the lab clearing was down near the dock. Everything comes in by boat. Um, and so the modern buildings are all down there. Kodak was in the old lab clearing clearing, which is up a couple hundred stairs, mm -hmm. uh, but basically you're up in the forest. And so, you know, I love the forest and going to sleep with the forest, making all of its forest noises outside your window every night um, was great. And it meant that I saw things when I, you know, went home in the evening. I saw cool animals. And anyway, it was just a much better way to live. And it was certainly worth living, living with termites, which was really the only downside. But um, so I had a bathtub. And I outfitted it for this crocodile and decided to see if I could get it to maturity. I got it to the point that it had absorbed all of its egg sac and had sutured up and um, and it was clearly ready to go. It never developed anything like affection for me. Mm -hmm. I could, it did not seem to have that capacity. And I decided it was time. But it didn't, it was also not hostile. Um, no, it was not hostile. It yeah. was indifferent to me as yeah. far as I could tell. Um, but... Anyway, one day I decided it was time to set it free. Um, Muriel Hemingway, of all people, happened to, the island is a place where celebrities sometimes come to do little photo shoots in tropical places and things. Anyway, she was there for what reason I don't remember. And, and you've been like assigned to her, be like you'd be the biologist who, who does no, something with her? Or? I, think, I think what it was was um, uh, certain people knew I had this crocodile that I was raising, Shelly was her name, um, and uh, I... It was time to take Shelly uh, to the water. I didn't want to release her right off of BCI because I didn't know if I would behaviorally have disrupted her. So I wanted to release her somewhere where there were no people. 
Mm -hmm. And anyway, I carried her to the boat that I was going to take. I, I had a Panama Canal boat license at the time. Of course you and did. I took Shelly to the water in my mouth just because I wanted to make it as normal as possible. And, you know, that's pretty normal looking. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, Mariel Hemingway got wind of the fact that we were going to be releasing a crocodile. So me and Mariel, Hem Mariel Hemingway and a couple of my friends went to an adjacent island and released Shelly. And that's all I know. Um, and it actually made the Stry newsletter. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So the the powers that be at Stry were, were okay with all of this? I don't frankly remember how many rules I was breaking. You know, I was a long-term resident and I was trusted. So, you yeah. know, I mean. Yeah, you were there for like 19 months. And so, you know, I, I was there with you for a couple of those months. But at this point, I think I was in Madagascar doing my own research. Yeah. So, um, yeah, once you're there for a while, they, they start giving you uh, – a little more leeway. So anyway, I think the moral to this story is, yes, that picture looks almost inexplicable. <laughs> but when you think about it, it's actually got a perfectly normal explanation. Um, I guess the part of the... I, di I didn't know some of those details, but I knew, knew most of them. I don't remember how it is that we ended up with a poster of it. Ah, my good friend Cecile took that picture and ah. years later actually sent us this poster. Yeah, um, okay. So that's how we ended up with it. Cool. Doubt Cecile is watching, but if you are, hey... Good to yeah. see you. It's pretty late there. She's in Germany, True. right? True. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we didn't answer the question. I mean, we kind of did. Which animals can feel love? You started. <laughs> then we're on crocodiles. <laughs> right. The question. Uh, so, um, so cats versus dogs and, um, and love and cats having less emotion. So I would say the basic substructure of love is about maternal love. That mm -hmm. gets broadened into all kinds of things, including romantic love and... Um, uh, fraternal love and all of these things. And this is indeed the through line of the two or three chapters in our book on sex and gender relationship and parenthood and childhood. You know, love starts as this, this mother baby bond and then gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you have such abstractions as love for country. Right. And yeah. it's basically the, the best approximation of what it is, is a willingness, um, to sacrifice on behalf of others as you would on behalf of yourself. Yeah. All right. So mothers have to sacrifice in, on behalf of offspring. Now, with respect to dogs and cats, realize that there is an asymmetry in the cat love relationship, which probably accounts for what you're detecting, that does not necessarily exist in the dog relationship. Dogs have been with us for something like 30,000 years, I think, the longest domesticate yeah. um, by far. And the reason for that is because they were our hunting partners and everything else we've domesticated has to do with farming, which is only the last 10,000 years or so. Mm -hmm. So dogs are ancient partners of ours. Cats are very new partners. I think it's more like 3,000 years or something like that. I don't actually know. I know it's less. It's a lot, a lot less. But I don't know. But the point is cats were domesticated um, as basically guardians of grain stores, whereas dogs are domesticated as partners in lots of things. And so the willingness to sacrifice on behalf of you is something that is wired into the dog very deeply. An adult cat doesn't have the same relationship with its owner. So yes, cats are capable of love, but the love that a mother cat has for her baby cats um, means that the wiring is there. Mm -hmm. But the relationship between the baby and the mother isn't, you, you know, it is not necessarily the structure of the universe that babies should sacrifice for their mother, the mother, because the whole point is future generations should actually train them out of that. So, But one of the pieces of evidence that um, cats, even as adults, when they're domestic cats, effectively have a relationship with us that is akin to we are their mothers, is that in the wild, non-domestic cats, those cats that purr, and not all cats purr, but those species of cats that purr never purr as adults. They, they lose the ability. And obviously, domestic cats retain their purring. Uh, and uh, it seems to be a um, indication of sort of imagined relationship with, with parents. Are you sure that they lose it completely as adults, even when injured, they don't purr? That is what I, it's been a while since I've gone back to um, to check on that, but that is what I understood to be the case when I was first thinking about this, but that's probably 10, 15, even 20 years ago at this point. Yeah. I'd, I'd want to go back and actually check for sure. The other thing I, that I think is a reliable result is that cats don't talk to each other, but they do talk to us, which yeah. is interesting. It suggests that they, you know, a baby cat mewing, uh, sending signals to its mother about yeah. its location and its state. They'll, so they'll the vocalize that, sometimes if they're fighting, right? Like you can oh, tell like two, two cats when they're, well, but not even like two cats when they're play fighting, 
you know, you know it's fine until they start making guttural vocalizations, uh, at which point, like, someone may be about to get hurt. And yeah. you know, our guy, two of our guys do this a fair bit. Uh, but they don't sit around talking to each other, right. whereas they'll talk to us. Yeah. Right? Like, right. And it's not obvious because you're generally there when they're talking, so you think they do it all the time. But yeah. you can document this, you know, with cameras that they don't yeah. meow at each other. Hey guys, that was a clip from our monthly private Q&A that you can get access to at my Heather Hyang's Patreon. And you can also get access there to all of the past paid subscriber content. So please consider joining us there. Did you mention that these private Q&As are the key to living a better life and living to tell the tale? I forgot to do that. These private Q&As are in fact the key to living a better life and what? Living to tell the tale. Living to tell the tale. Go ahead, live to tell the tale. Join us there. See ya.